Good morning. I call this meeting of the House Ways and Means Committee to order, and I note for the record that a quorum is present. And so um, we have one bill up today, which is Senate File 4027. And, uh, well, it's not Senate File 4027. And so Representative Noor. All right, good morning. So I move, or Representative Noor moves that Senate File 4027 be placed on the general register. We're also moving the A24 354 amendment. So Represent Representative Noor moves the delete everything amendment coded A24 0354. So please explain your amendment, Representative Noor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, it's good to be in the, maybe the final, final uh, week. <laughs> <laughs> Don't count on it. <laughs> well, I've already jinxed it. Anyway, um, Madam Chair uh, and members, this is the Ride Share Drivers Fund Program. Uh, this bill establishes uh, Ride Share Drivers Fund Program through the Department of Employment and Economic Development. It's, uh, it appropriates $2 million uh, from the Workforce Development Fund, this is one-time appropriation, which will be in a revolving loan. Madam Chair and members, the program requirement under this is to make sure that anyone who is a TNC driver, that is uh, the Uber and Lyft drivers, who I'm sure you've heard a lot about them, uh, this uh, makes sure that they have some resources in case they need to buy a vehicle uh, to do that type of business. Uh, it looks into their income. It should be below 80000 to qualify for the program. And it also establishes some other guidelines within the bill. Uh, for example, the loan program will allow up to 15,000 for all vehicles and up to 20,000 for wheelchair accessible van. Uh, this is a loan at 0% interest and it requires the drivers to meet all the other requirements needed to own a vehicle. This fund will be run through the CDFI, uh, which is uh, community-based organizations as a partnership with the Department of Employment and Economic Development. Uh, Madam Chair and members, uh, simply this, that's the bill and it's going to be in a revolving loan and also it allows the commissioner to accept gifts and contribution in kind as a exempt uh, funding if anyone wants to contribute to that fund program. Thank you, Representative Noor. And I did check with House Fiscal, and this did not need a fiscal note because all it is is a direct appropriation is the only funding uh, piece of it. So just wanted to note that. And discussion. Representative Acom. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, thank you, um, Chair Noor, for this bill. And I just really want to say thank you for um, having the um, extra funds for wheelchair accessible vehicles. Um, my husband is in a wheelchair, and so knowing often that it's challenging to get um, a an Uber or some sort of a ride share kind of thing that is um, accommodating that. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So there's, there's a lot of questions in this presentation that I'm not sure that we have answers for. Uh, first of all, do we have a list of these um, what's the term called um, um, local community economic development grantees in institutions and I, I forget where the name is. Uh, Madam Chair members the CDFI is already registered with the Department of Employment Economic Development for example for the Greater Minnesota Minnesota Initiative Foundations are registered with the Department of Economic Development as CDFIs Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and, and uh, Mr. Chair. So it looks like um, these are zero interest loans and these grantees are determining the parameters and the limits on, on what's going on with it. They're allowed to keep 10% of the cost. So I'm assuming that is uh, above uh, the $15,000. Question is also when a, a loan defaults, where, what happens to the asset, and and what is flexible collateral requirements? Representative Noor. Madam Chair, members, I think the flexible collateral uh, in this sense is someone who may not have a good credit, and someone who wants to be able to be employed to provide uh, income to his household. So we are providing that flexibility to the CDFI, and also to determine the parameters, the terms and rules and regulations of how that 
loan program will be administered will be established through the partnership with the CDFIs and the Department of Employment and Economic Development. Representative Petersburg. Uh, uh, thank you. And and so won't the vehicle be the, the bulk of the collateral? Uh, it seems that's the way most loans for vehicles are, is the vehicle itself is collateral. And, and what happens to the asset if the um, uh, individual uh, fails to live up to the contract? Representative Knorr. Madam Chair and members, because I think there are two instances here. You, you need to purchase the vehicle. You may end up uh, going through a loan program with the dealership, or you may spend your own money. So in a in sense, I think part of the terms and regulations that will be established with the CDFIs, they may be able to include that as the collateral. So in this bill, we're not including, because there may be different ways for, to ac acquire that vehicle. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, but I still didn't hear what happens to whatever collateral is available if the loan is is not paid off. Representative Noor. Madam Chair, members, I think as, as I stated, uh, the terms that will be stipulated by the CDFI will include how that money will be recouped in case someone does not pay, even if it's uh, to repossess the vehicle, whatever terms that is going to be included in the, uh, in the application process when, when the funds are uh, given to the driver. Representative Petersburg. Thank you. I'll turn my time over to others. Representative Farr. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, Representative Knorr, I, I was going to call this a maybe a labor dispute. I don't think that's fair. It's um, because we're talking about independent contractors here. But is there any other place where D directly appropriates money um, into a labor negotiation, independent uh, contractor negotiations? Is there, is there any other place that we would do this for any other independent contractors in the state? Representative Knorr. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair members. We do have a lot of funds that go through the Department of Employment and Economic Development. Uh, this is not the only one. And in this bill, there is nothing uh, about labor uh, issues in this bill. Representative Farr. No, I understood. Um, no issues, no, no labor issues discussed in this bill, but we're all here because there are um, concerns and issues. Uh, the bill, I assume, is here because there are concerns and issues. So um, one, just just one other example then, Representative Knorr, of where, of where, we, where D gets involved in um, independent contractors and directly appropriating money, money to independent contractors. Representative Knorr. Madam Chair, members, I think if you look at the South program, I believe that's the term used, it's, for, it's meant for people who are going to become independent contractors, self-employed, using the Workforce Development Fund. Representative Farr. That's it, Madam Chair. Representative Rarick. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, if we're going to be taking $2 million out of the Workforce Development Fund, what's the balance left? I can go to Representative Nor. I will say, too, it still fits within the workforce development target that we did set in this committee. But Representative Nor can maybe speak to the broader workforce development fund. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. I think I don't have the exact numbers because there was a, already a bill that allocated some of the workforce development fund. Maybe the nonpartisan staff can help us because there was another bill that was up, we appropriated $17 million, and I don't think they're spending that whole amount. Ms. Adrians. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Rarick. So uh, Representative Norris is correct that the jobs bill is appropriating some money from the Workforce Development Fund, but it's well underneath the target that was set in the budget resolution. So that was $17 million. They're going at about $12 million. This would be $2 million, and I believe there's about $80 million as a balance in the Workforce Development Fund. Representative Rarick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I don't know that we've talked so much about the remaining balance, so I, I knew about the target, but I didn't know what the balance was, so thank you for that. Um, Representative <coughs> Noor, I'm wondering, so we talked a little bit about what happens at default. So if somebody doesn't pay back this revolving fund loan, who gets priority? So you had said that either the person had paid out of their own funds personally to purchase the vehicle, which I find <coughs> curious because you've got... Uh, an income may not exceed 80000 so that's in it probably unlikely. But more likely would be if a bank would be uh, you know, the majority of the loan. And so who, who gets priority if there's a default? 
Representative Noor. Madam Chair, members, if you look at line 1.22, agrees to any other term set by the lender, those, uh, that section will include everything to address the issue that you have just mentioned in terms of who gets to keep what. Because if there is someone who took a loan from a bank or they took uh, a loan from the dealership, there are terms that they have to meet. So I think there's always the primary, and we may become the secondary. So in this instance, I'm assuming the lender will put this as a secondary rather than the primary. Representative Rarick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, that's kind of what I thought, too, because I can't imagine a bank saying, oh, yeah, you know what, you keep the car, state of Minnesota. Uh, so what is the recourse then to uh, kind of, I would say claw back, but to get back those funds that have been expended because it's a revolving loan fund. So those funds need to come back in and be paid back. So what is the recourse since we're not going to get the vehicle back in probably most of the instances because I'm sure the bank or the dealership, uh, which is going to go to a bank, <laughs> do, doing the loan are going to get that vehicle back. So how do we get the funds back if they default? Madam Chen, Representative Noor. Um, those are the terms that the, the lender will have to put in writing uh, to make sure that they agreed to uh, between the, uh, the TNC driver and the lender who's going to be providing the loan to that individual. We do have various programs similar to this, which we also don't put uh, a significant collateral in that process because of that issue. We let the lenders determine how to claw back or receive uh, the funds that they've spent to make sure that we have more money coming back to the revolving loan. Representative Rarick. Thank you, Madam Chair. So let's talk about some of those other um, <coughs> programs that you've got that use Workforce Development Fund or similar programs. Do you happen to know, uh, like, maybe what's that default rate? Representative Noor. Madam Chair said. and members, I don't have that number. Maybe I can get it to you. For example, we have the Entrepreneur Fund. We have the Emerging Developer Funds that uh, through the Department of Employment and Economic Development. So I can request uh, numbers and send it to you. Representative Rarick. Thank you. No, I, I didn't expect you to have it off the top of your head, but we should have that conversation. And since I'm assuming this is not going to go back to um, – a policy committee to kind of vet this out. This is probably the only committee, as we've seen repeatedly through this session. So we're kind of it. So uh, I don't know how many issue area experts we've got on our side in this. We've got a banker, so that's super helpful. But um, so this is sort of it. So I'm trying to get to uh, what happens when we get to default. And do you have any, um, any idea what kind of default rate we can expect with this particular fund? Representative Noor. Madam Chair, members, I cannot speculate what will be the default rate because we don't have this program running. Representative Rick. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, and that's sort of what I was getting at is if we've looked at, you had said we've done this before, that the Workforce Development Fund has been used for such things. It'd be important to know sort of what is the default rate. So, um, and maybe it's very low. I don't know. We simply don't know. I think that could be an issue here is especially when you're talking about income that doesn't exceed 80000 And uh, also, you know, I had read an article, um, I think it was in the Reformer, that talked about one of the Uber or Lyft drivers that bought a $64,000 vehicle. Um, and, I'm, you know, it's just an example. So that's a big loan, 64000 just as an example. And they can, what, they can get up between uh, 15000 Trying to remember if it was ten or fifteen, but it's much smaller. It's a much smaller amount than what the total will be. So this is a real concern: is if we already have an income cap of eighty thousand, and they're buying a vehicle that's, you know, I just bought a new vehicle and it was over thirty thousand. And most vehicles are, if they're brand new, which they're going to be probably doing, is going to be over thirty thousand. So that's a lot. And if this is for sure less than half of that, at the best case scenario then somebody else has got to come up with the other half. So our, my concern is if they are not the first priority, if, if the state of Minnesota is not the first priority on the lien, we're not going to get the vehicle back, but there's going to be some sort of collateral. Don't know really what it is. We don't know what the default rate is when we do this in other situations. I have some really, really big concerns about creating this when we don't know very much, and it sounds like the state of Minnesota and the taxpayers um, and actually the businesses that pay into Workforce Development Fund um, could be left 
with not a whole lot. I don't, you know, I have no idea. We have, we have no idea what's going to happen, right? So we've got a lot of unknowns. Um, I think it's very plausible that the $2 million could be all loaned out and not sure that we're going to get a whole lot of it back. I have no idea because we have nothing, we have no data in front of us to, to make any assumptions or predictions because we know absolutely nothing about any other program. We don't know what this potential uh, default rate is going to be. We have no idea what the default rate is currently in programs like this. So I have really big concerns about this. I'm not sure that we're ready to do this. And if, if this is the, the linchpin that fixes the Uber Lyft I issue, I don't know. I mean, is that why we're doing that, doing this, uh, Representative North? Representative North. Madam Chair members, I, that's not the reason why we're doing this, but at least this is more to allow those who have been coming to us and say we need uh, a good system, a good transportation system, ecosystem for our state. And uh, in fact, if you look at uh, the way we set this program, Uber, Lyft, they can contribute to this program. We're giving them that option, and I think some of them are thinking how they can contribute funds to this similar project uh, so that their drivers can access vehicles uh, to do the transportation. Representative Rarick. Thank you. I wasn't going to continue, Madam Chair, but um, okay. So we're doing this in the 11th hour. It's not going through the proper policy committees to look at policy. We don't know the default rate of any other program that you're referencing. Um, this is not going to be first priority. We don't know what the collateral is going to be. We don't know what we're going to be doing to try to claw that money back. And this is not part of the global deal to keep Uber Lyft here. Why are we doing this today then? Because this is literally 11th hour. We were supposed to be done with Ways and Means two or three meetings ago. So I don't understand if this has nothing to do with the Uber Lyft deal, that this is irrelevant to that. Why are we doing this today? Do you want to answer that, Representative Nor? Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think uh, we've got work to do, uh, and it's part of our job process to come and do this process. And I think uh, at one point I had uh, someone in this room say that the chair for Ways of Means was uh, the Uber chair. So that was a long time ago. But I think uh, 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 the point that I'm trying to make here is we are the final place that we can do uh, this work. And I think we can get it done through this process to make sure we we explain what is in the bill and send it back to the general register. Representative Rarick. Well, Madam Chair, I, I don't know why we're doing this. Literally, we have today and tomorrow left of session. We have to be done tomorrow by midnight. And if this has nothing to do with the Uber Lyft deal to keep them here in Minnesota, because they have said emphatically that they are going to be leaving Minnesota if the conditions are the same. We are 2% of their market, 2% for Uber Lyft. So I don't think they have a tremendous amount of interest. And if this has nothing to do with the global deal, I have no idea why we're even doing this today. So I'm a no on this because I have no idea what we're doing here. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair. Microphone issues. Uh, question for either nonpartisan staff or the author. Um, so when I was mayor, we had a revolving loan fund is there any part of this that is forgivable once they've achieved a certain payment level back to the revolving loan fund? Representative Noor. Madam Chair, members, there's nothing uh, in this bill that says that it's forgivable at certain times. So this is a loan program, which is at 0% interest. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair. Next question is, what is the percent of grant oversight management that deed is going to peel off to administer this. Um, typically, I believe it's um, five to 10, depending on the types of grant programs. So if you could help us with that as well. Yeah, Representative Nash, it's in the bill, but I'll go to Representative Knorr for that. Sometimes we don't see things until it, when it comes out real late. Representative Knorr. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the, uh, the, the percentage is 10 percent in this bill. Okay. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, next question is, is this designed for any TNC? Because after the lack of a global agreement gets passed and there's nothing there, Uber and Lyft are leaving. So does this allow the, the new upstarts that we see on the news? Is this going to be available for their drivers? Representative Knorr. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, this is meant for drivers who have 
who have been in the system. It doesn't give to somebody who just wants to jump in and say, I want to do uh, TNC. So this is particularly funded for those who are already doing the work as uh, rideshare drivers. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and that's the crux, is that without a global agreement, without a fix, Uber and Lyft has already, already said they're going to be gone. So that means then that this bill will not be available for the new TNC drivers, because there's a couple of different apps that have popped up with the threat of Uber and Lyft leaving. And I'm just wondering, are those new apps going to be considered in the system so that they can access this? Representative Noor. Madam Chair and members, uh, if you are a TNC <coughs> driver, you work for every entity that is providing services to uh, that area. So if it's Uber, if it's Lyft, if it's anything, uh, this does not, is, it's not attached to any uh, TNC company. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair. And then I'm, I'm just going to echo what Representative Rarick said. It's, it's strange that it's coming out of the Workforce Development Fund that is paid for by uh, in, or it's, the contributions go in from uh, businesses, and it's just it seems very counterintuitive for this. Um, I, and I did want to come back to the conversation around the default because we didn't really get a lot of answers there. And I understand that it hasn't happened. So, but I, I would have to think that the author has modeled or at least thrown out there some ideas as to the relative default rate, because in anybody in any in any economic pillar that you look at, there are defaults for various reasons. Something happens with a family member and things go sideways. I'm just trying to figure out uh, what, what level of default does this program have to go through before there's another uh, call on the Workforce Development Fund to put more money in? Because if, if you have suddenly a rash of defaults, and they're not paying back into the revolving loan fund, then your fund is empty. So if the author would. Representative Noor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. That's why we have the provisions here. This is one time only fund whereby the account will be able to accept uh, gifts, contributions, or other in-kind services to that account. If it ends, that means there will be no resources for the loan program to continue to fund the, the, the driver. So this is only one-time only appropriation meant to for the purpose of the rideshare driver program. Representative Nash. Well, um, I guess we'll have a, a more thorough conversation on the floor. But uh, And maybe I didn't read this, but are, are you um, giving incentives? And I saw you gave an incentive for wheelchair accessible. Are you giving incentives for electric vehicles as well? Representative North. Madam Chair and members, there's nothing in this bill that uh, stipulates uh, electric vehicle. Rep <laughs> Representative Nash. I'm I'm thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to make sure because, you know, we apparently all love our electric vehicles, but hey, not, not, not enough, yeah. not enough to yeah. appropriate some money for it. So thank you. Be That's order. in a different bill. <laughs> Representative Petersburg. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I thought I was ahead of uh, Representative Nash, who I thought was going to close up for us. But I do have a couple questions I forgot to ask when I was in talking about. Uh, this really refers to the qualif qualifying uh, requirements of the driver. And on 1.15, it says that they had to be a TNC driver for at least one year, indicating that they already have a vehicle, uh, which means then that this really is uh, loans for replacement vehicles. And so I just want to make sure we're clear about that, that this is... Uh, for replacement vehicles, I'm assuming when, when they wear out or whatever. But my real questions come from 1.18 down to 1.20 when it talks about requiring uh, legally required insurance, including liability, as well as uh, verification on keeping the registration current. Two questions. One is, I'm assuming that legally required liability insurance would be at the same level that all commercial passenger vehicles have. And you can answer that question. But my other question is, who's going to be verifying that this is actually going to happen? Representative Noor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. All this will be processed by the lender. So the lender will put all those things into the times to verify uh, when, uh, when they uh, give the funds to, as you recall, it's, it's a replacement because they drive a lot. And they, somebody has to demonstrate they're able to pay, which is actually on line 1.17. 
having that history that this person has been doing this work, they're able to pay the funds, you, you will be able to provide them the loan based on that. So that means we've already had some few things that we require them, and if you're going to become a TNC driver, they are required uh, insurances uh, which uh, the, uh, the owner of the vehicle will have to purchase. As, uh, uh, on their personal, uh, and then they may also buy uh, other endorsement or uh, other things to make sure that they're able to secure their appropriate insurance. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And so I just want to make sure we get on record that we are anticipating and we are expecting that this would be the same liability for all commercial uh, passenger carriers uh, because I think that's important to protect those that are riding in it. Uh, my final question is just one of... Um, Implementation. Um, do you have, does, Mr. Chair, do you have an idea about how long we're going? it's going to take to get this implemented and put into place? Because some of these new programs take a while. Uh, I'm sure somebody needs to vet out the uh, companies giving away the money and, and what the parameters are because I, it says in here that the parameters for the loan have to be agreed to by the commissioner and then the funding has to be available and implemented and uh, process for for the formals forms and other stuff to verify everything. It's going to take some time Do you have an idea how long it's going to take to implement? Representative Knorr. Madam Chair members uh, the Commissioner will determine that the time frame once we, they establish uh, the uh, Partnership with the CDFI they'll be able to identify the process going forward So I'm anticipating that it will take a short time period because this is direct appropriation creating the revolving loan and once they have uh, the RFP set and they've chosen an entity that will be running under CDFIs, this will be able to be put in place quickly. Representative Petersburg. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, I, I guess uh, I had made uh, the expectation at least that you've contacted the commissioner and the department and gotten some sort of parameters of what they thought would, would take to do that. Is, is that not the case? Representative Knorr. Madam Chair, members, I did connect with the department to make sure that we have got uh, appropriate language and ready to go because once we pass the bill, that becomes the effective <coughs> timeline that they'll be putting together. So they, they have done similar projects and they also have CDFIs already registered with the department. So I, I'm anticipating it's going to follow the same procedure that they have. Anything further, Representative Petersburg? Thank Repre you. Yep. Representative Novotny. Thank you, Chair. And I, I don't know if it's a question, more of a statement, but uh, I, I really think we should have had a financial or, or a fiscal note on this because um, no matter how many times we say it's a one-time funding, based on the past, um, and I think the past is the best predictor of the future, I think uh, this is going to be an ongoing thing. There will be tales in this because with everything else that the state has socialized, um, it ends up costing more in the end. So, um, you know, the fiscal note should be there because based on everything else, just earlier this week, we had the socialized uh, paid family medical leave. Um, and a year ago, they said they had enough funding and that was fine. And then come back and tell us less than a year later that they need a 25% increase that they said wouldn't be a problem. Um, if we look at socialized daycare, now we have to fix the government has to have a solution to their fixing daycare by socializing it. We have to fix medicine because we're socializing medicine, and then we have to have a government solution for socialized medicine. Light rail, um, we're more than twice the multi-billion dollar project to go 12 miles on a, on a bus line that was established and financially stable. And... I guess I'll have a question at the end, but uh, briefly, Representative Nash, Representative Rarick, uh, the, I believe the question, the answer to the question you guys had is why are we here, it's leverage. So Representative uh, Noor, uh, my question will be for you. Uh, will you absolutely commit that in, in less than a year we won't be back in the same Ways and Means Committee and we won't be adding more money to this program? Representative Novotny, a couple of things here before. Um, this is like there's you can state your opinion on if a bill needs a fiscal note or not, but this is a two million dollar appropriation in the year 2025. That is what it is. Um, it is the prerogative of the legislature to come back at any time and introduce a bill 
to continue to appropriate. This is a very different situation than anything else you named, and that's fine to have your opinion, but I just want to state that this is a situation where it is exactly what it is here. I have talked to House Fiscal Staff. You see it is just a $2 million appropriation in 2025. That is what it is. In terms of Representative Knorr's intent or you know his motives or whatever, it, I will leave it up to him on how he would like to handle that. Representative Knorr. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I think you've stated uh, uh, what I was going to say. But I think what I've seen from my colleagues on the other side, they were all wearing something says, keep Uber and Lyft. <laughs> this is keeping Uban lift in the state of Minnesota. This is supporting the drivers. Exactly. This is not supporting the multinational companies uh, who are making a lot of money. This is for those drivers who are committed, waking up every single day to provide the service to those who need in the state of Minnesota. I think we're and I will now just say any further discussion to the A24 amendment before we move to adoption. Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. 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 The motion prevails and the A24-0354 amendment has been adopted. Final discussion to the bill. Lead Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Noor. Uh, Representative Noor, um, you know, 65 days ago, the Minneapolis City Council uh, made a poor public policy decision and they overrode Mayor Fry's veto of the rideshare ordinance. Um, since that moment, I think all of us have known that the legislature is going to have to take action on this, and that action is going to have to be bipartisan and bicameral. So while I disagree with the substance of, that is in your bill, uh, I do support the uh, effort that the majority is moving forward, um, another tool that we can help reach agreement on that, again, will need to be bipartisan and bicameral. So I'll be voting no today on this, but I do look forward to um, further conversations on this. Thank you. Further discussion to the bill. Representative Knorr, final words. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. It's a good bill. Please vote yes. Thank you. With that, I renew my motion that Senate File 4027, as amended, be placed on the General Register. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. No. The motion prevails, and Senate File 4027 has been placed on the General Register. I forgot to move the minutes. Don't go anywhere. So can I get a motion, Vice Chair Edelson, for approval of the minutes from Friday, May 17, 2024? So moved, Madam Chair. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails and the minutes have been adopted. And we're going to stand in recess. Oh. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> because I needed to have one last meeting because look at this gem of what I found when I got I found in my office. Please pass it around for the committee's. Uh, <laughs> this video of the Taiwanese parliament where the, the guy ran up and grabbed the actual bill and ran out of the chamber. No. <laughs> I'm doing with this. So I just couldn't say goodbye to Lead Garofalo. Um, and so we had to continue to keep this meeting open. And so with that, we are in recess. <laughs>